Okay, so we come to um, our question and answer session. And there has already been um, quite a few questions loaded into the into the uh, Q and A box. Um, some of them have already been answered, um, and so uh, we will go ahead and start with those that have not yet been uh, completely answered. Um, and so the first one is from Rati. Tanawala, I hope I said that right, um, and it's for Dr. Kaufman and Dr. Sumana. Um, she writes, um, your stories are incredibly powerful, both for the underrepresented groups, but also the clarity and integrity of your stories are powerful for managers and firms on what outstanding support from managers looks like when seen from the eyes of URGs. We need to get the stories told by URGs into a course that allows managers to discuss and internalize. I say that because having worked in industry for 39 years, I know that managers, especially first and second line managers who are hugely impacted in these careers and more managers need to internalize and learn how to be helpful. The story approach will work happy to have your insights and in creating impact through these stories. And I see that uh, Dr. Sumana has um, uh, provided some um, response, but I wanted to make sure that there's nothing else he or uh, Dr. Kaufman would like to say on this. The only other thing I would think is, is to say is, yes, uh, arming, first and second line managers with this knowledge is, is incredibly important. Um, I think, you know, so happy to help engage and, and be able to contribute there if there's if there's an opportunity to do so. Um, I think also then the awareness to those employees themselves uh, about, you know, other certain aspects too is important. So these are things that I learned throughout my career, um, just being aware of all of these, um, these programs that exist inside companies, you know, that, you know, may not be your day job, but they're really helping you to get, you know, more capability and to be more integrated into that, that company culture and things like that. So I think, you know, they're, they're giving you permission to do that and you should, um, but also to being able to navigate bad managers is, is, is an art. And I think if we are, you know, going to succeed, um, that would be a good skill. I, I said that. I, I said that very nicely. I, I said that very nicely. I hope so. Thank you, Alan. Yeah. I think I think you hit the nail on the head, especially the navigating managers. I think that that is so instrumental in everything that we do. Um, and you can do that with your network. So think about. Um, gaining allies in your network and outside of your network. So people who can vouch for you and who can support you, even if you have a challenging manager or you're in a challenging department, if you have allies around you, it becomes very difficult for, for folks to um, create these barriers. Thank you very much, Dr. Sumana. Um, the next question uh, is from Lydia for Jill. Uh, Lydia, do you want to go ahead and ask your question uh, to Jill directly? Sure, Jill, I was wondering if you could uh, let us know what, when the company began to put in place policies and procedures that meant that managers and people who were hiring would be aware of the need to bring diversity in and hire these individuals who are now present in the company and also to begin to promote them up the line. Because um, the numbers that you have are, are quite impressive in, in many ways. Uh, clearly, like all companies, you know, there's a lot to do, but that's true universally. So I'm wondering when you can, if you know when this, these efforts began. Sure, I can start. So we, I would say that we've been on this journey of being more intentional about diversity and leadership for probably more than a decade. 
And it's an evolution. You know, we've had years and year like 2018, 2019, where at the corporate level, we had a goal on increasing diversity and executive leadership and the, you know, bonuses that are paid out across all of our management team was a factor, a, a factor included how well we were uh, performing against that goal. And so I think that that kind of action is, is very visible. It's something that, you know, down to the first line of management, there's awareness of. And then additionally, you know, modifying and updating the kind of hiring procedures and processes. For example, I just hired someone onto my team and we have a requirement that you have a diverse, not only candidate pool, but you also have to have a diverse panel of people who are interviewing. And that doesn't like, that would mean 100% women on the panel would not meet that criteria. You have to have diversity in gender and diversity in ethnicity so that you can make sure that we have diversity of thought. And that's really what we're going for. Great. Uh, the the next question, uh, Lydia, if you would stay on, um, uh, I think you're going to answer this one. It's from an uh, anonymous attendee who asked, without any disrespect intended, I'm wondering why Ruby was not able to talk for herself during this event. And I would like to answer that because I did the majority of invitations here. And initially I invited Dr. Pedro Pizarro to come present who is, he is the CEO of Edison International um, and a Puerto Rican. And as you might imagine, as a global CEO, he's a little bit busy. And so he had no room to fit this into his calendar on any of the three dates that we had accessible. And of course we have three days, feels if you're on our end, like a lot of time and energy to put this thing together, but it's quite limited in the number of speakers and individuals that we can have. And Pedro was really quite insistent that he thought the best speaker to, uh, to speak in his stead would be Jill for several reasons. First of all, and these are reasons that he didn't give me, but that I will give you, is that as a woman, she is represents a, 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 a group which is historically underrepresented in the higher echelons of companies anywhere. She's an engineer, a woman engineer at the high levels that she has achieved are rare. Secondly, she's been an incredible advocate, not just for women, as you've heard, but for all members of diversity group. I did not know of Rosie at the time. And besides, I had my one little precious slot for a relatively junior person filled. We're trying to have as much breath as we can in these sessions so that we can know where else we should look and begin a process of essentially excavation of the lessons we've learned and we can begin to think about how we scale them. Thank you. If I could add too, I, I would say I, I love that we're asking this question. I think we should be asking this question every time we have an event, internal, external. I get invited to a lot of speaking engagements as you can imagine and I don't say yes to all of them but when I find ones that you know I think would be great for us as a business to participate in and don't work for me. I do include other people. In fact, Ruby has represented me on a clean buildings conference here just in the last couple of months. So I think we need to be requiring more of that both internally and externally. And you know, I, I for example, would like to get to a point where we stop seeing all male panels or all Caucasian panels. Like we should it should be standard even in conferences that are not about diversity and that's just going to require all of us to to be putting those requirements on the organizations that we work with great uh thank you very much uh did you want to respond lydia or, or is that good oh no that's wonderful that's exactly okay, right great uh th thank you very much jill um okay so um i guess i i just had a, a comment um first. Um, and it's uh, for Dr. Kaufman. I, I, mean, I didn't mean to be disrespectful when I said that your, um, your career path was uh, very methodical. Um, you know, I, I think basically um, it, what I took away is, is that you're advocating for um, really um, the importance of some training and career planning um, for, for people who are going into STEM fields and, and leadership positions. Um, and um, you know, I, I think uh, your 
um, your analysis or or paradigm or whatever you want to call it on on these um, the S curve and the various inflection points is is very illuminating. Um, likewise, uh, Dr. Sumana, um, I think that um, you're you know basically advocating for some formal training, more formal training in, in leadership. And uh, Dr. Kaufman mentioned, you know, the SACNAS or the, the Linton Pudri uh, SACNAS Leadership Institute. I, it's something that I went through myself. I think it's a, it's a very fine program. You know, it's, it's limited. It's, uh, you know, a week-long program in the summer uh, with some follow-up um, uh, at annual meetings, uh, which are mainly social. Um, so, yeah, I guess um, what I'd like to say is that, um, you know, as a member of CIOS, we have the opportunity to talk periodically with the director of the NSF, um, um, is a very long name, uh, Dr. Pancha Nathan, he goes by Panch anyway. So Pancha's catchphrase is uh, scale and speed or something like that. He wants to do everything at scale and speed. And so I'm wondering, um, mainly for uh, Dr. Sumana, Dr. Kaufman, but uh, um, um, Ms. Anderson, if you'd like to pipe him in as well, um, are there any thoughts on how we can uh, really increase the scale of leadership training, of career planning training um, in this country? Is it something that we could ask NSF to help us do? I can I can just give one of my experiences. I didn't really go into it too much. I was also a part of an NIGMS um, biotech training grant when I did my uh, doctorate uh, at KU. Um, you know, one of the things that they had, one of the programmatic activities, was you know left to the devices of the uh, a lot of the faculty there, and some of them got very creative with some of the uh, curriculum. And I think you know, in in terms of training them for the technical aspect of biotechnology is one thing, but training them on GMP manufacturing and, you know, getting into other things that are not necessarily as traditional, right? We talked about creativity. We talked about diversity. You know, we talked about all of these other things. These are mechanisms to which I think we could more broadly apply um, leadership training and perhaps even organizational awareness. There's, you know, a lot of books on characteristics of being a serial innovator. There's a lot of, you know, books on, um, organizational dynamics and how to navigate, we, this could definitely be taught and at least at the minimum, make folks aware. Thank you. I absolutely agree. So when I think about uh, scale, for instance, you look at um, SACNIS, BSCP, NIGMS, NIH, the NSF, they all have uh, programs to get you into, into college and uh, graduate or professional school and help you succeed there, right? So when we're thinking about the scale and how do you scale the leadership element of it, there should be specific components on how do you lead? What is a leader? What are the seven stages of leadership? Um, I think that that would be very critical. I was also a... Um, uh, a Ruth Kirsten um, fellow through the NIG MS in grad school. Uh, they taught us a lot on um, how to write papers, how to be an academic, but very little on actual leadership. How do you run a group? How do you run a research project? How do you become a manager and manage a team? Um, so that is an opportunity. All of these different platforms have um, hundreds of thousands of, uh, collectively hundreds of thousands of fellows, that's how you scale it. Now you've gone from just uh, a few select organizations focusing on leadership to hundreds of thousands of fellows getting access to the leadership program in itself. So I think we should start to think about um, from a programmatic standpoint, point, what are the different, the different stages of leadership? When should they be introduced to um, our STEM students? And really push that forward as they are growing in their different careers and different career paths. What do we want to expose to them? What are complementary skills that they should be um, thinking about? I think that could be really helpful. 
If I could add too, I think it ties back to something that Dr. Samana said in his opening remarks about apprenticeship. And there's an opportunity here to scale through maybe more corporate partnerships. You know, think about um, when I was an undergrad, I did a co-op with an engineering firm in, in Boston and we hire summer interns here at SCE, but to think about more opportunities, maybe more intentional partnerships where students could get uh, real world experience you know, out in the business, even if they intend to maybe go back and, and continue a career in academia, I think that opportunity with real world experience would, would always be beneficial. Great. Uh, th thank you very much. Um, there's one point of clarification uh, that was asked in the, um, in the Q&A. Um, we're referring to SACNAS. SACNAS is the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans in Science. Um, okay, well, uh, that brings us to a little bit, a couple minutes over our session time. Uh, Lydia, um, would you like to um, break now? Yes, we will break now. Uh, we have uh, we will reconvene exactly at two thirty five, uh, so that people who are coming in for the second session will be able to see that started on time. Thank you all for your talk and thank you participants for your questions. Very excellent discussion. Thank you, and I'll see yes, you. Yes, thanks. At thanks. I, I'd like to add my thanks to Dr. Uh, Samana, Dr. Kaufman and Ms. Anderson, thank, thank you so much uh, for taking the time and sharing your wisdom.